Hello. Well, I'm going to try and talk about technology, science, and maybe a little bit of maths. But actually, I'm going to start by talking about my sister. So when I was about five or six years old, my sister's about three years older. She must have been eight or nine, I suppose. We were playing in our back garden. There were some pieces of wood in the garden. I think they were left over from a fence that uh, had been dismantled. We were jumping on these pieces of wood. And my sister was showing off her new Wellington boots, very proud of these boots she was. So she jumped. And suddenly she was very still and screamed and screamed and screamed. Turns out there was a nail sticking up. And it had gone straight through the sole of her nice new Wellington boot into her foot. Well, of course, she's fine now. And um, thankfully, not even a scar. It was only a few days before the little girl had forgotten all about it. And we all have stories such as this, don't we? Growing up, I've suffered many injuries myself. We've all suffered different injuries. And we're used to the fact that human beings, living organisms, well, we, we repair ourselves. But imagine what would happen if a nail went through a piece of our technology. I suspect it would be very different. In fact, let's not imagine. It's a nice laptop. <laughs> well, <laughs> it took a key with it. <laughs> I'm afraid this laptop is no more. And of course, it, it doesn't take a nail through a laptop to destroy it. In fact, it doesn't take very much to stop our computers from working at all. Most of us can stop our computers working several times every week just by running the software on them. <laughs> I'm a computer scientist. I know these things. Now, the point I'm making is that our technology, our conventional technology, is very brittle. OK? It's, it's just not got the same properties as we're used to in biological organisms. I mean, imagine if I were to say to you what I would like to do as a computer scientist is to create a, a different kind of computer, a computer that I could drive a nail through. And it would not just survive, it might reconfigure its circuitry so that it could continue to work. How about a computer that could build itself? A computer that could program itself? computer that could be somehow perceiving its environment. How about, let's really go for it, I want a computer that's designed not at micro scales, not at nano scales. Let's go for quantum level upwards. Well, what am I talking about actually, of course? I'm talking about this. This is a human brain. It's not a real one, it's a model. But it's about the right size. Now, a human brain has all of these features, OK? People actually do get nails driven through the brain. Sometimes entire poles go through them, and actually they can reconfigure themselves. The remaining part, sometimes it can regrow a little bit, but the remaining parts of these brains can actually change, adjust, alter the function, and make themselves work again. And yes, these things here really can redesign themselves. Of course they program themselves in response to their environments. And yes, they really are designed by evolution from quantum level upwards. This is extraordinary, extraordinary design. Why can't we have technology that is as effective as this, our own brains? Why can't we? Well, to ask why not may seem ludicrous to you. I mean, how could we possibly, I mean, practically, really, how could we make a computer that could build itself and repair itself? 
And if you think about the differences, <coughs> actually there are very great differences between our poor, brittle technology here and <laughs> what, what's inside our own skulls. If you think about how our brains work, there's actually a very polarised differences here. So our brains are massively parallel. There's about 100 billion neurons in your brain, OK? 100 billion. Mostly, they're all working at the same time. On average, they're connected to about 20,000 of their companions. Computers and conventional technology, and if you think about it, even our mathematics and science, things don't tend to happen all at once. Things tend to be sequential. Our maths is very sequential, one thing after the other. Computers work in the same way, one thing after the other. Think about other differences. Our brains are distributed. Our, the, the, our thoughts are distributed across many parts of them. A computer is quite the opposite. And again, most of our technology, most of the way we organize ourselves, we like centralized things. In a computer, centralized memory, a centralized processing unit. It's not surprising if I stick a nail through that and knock it out. If you've got centralized things, one tiny flaw, one tiny uh, fault, the whole thing falls over. Think about something else. Think about randomness. Randomness helps us be who we are. We interact with our environments in a kind of random way. That helps build our neural connections. But further than that, randomness in nature is part of the solution. Okay? Randomness in random gen genetic drift drives evolution. So random genetic mutation actually creates species themselves. Randomness in our technology, in our sciences, in our mathematics, <coughs> randomness makes it fail. Randomness is part of the problem for our technology and our, the way we do things, it's part of the solution for biology. Why are there such these massive differences? Let's think about one more. Let's think about information. In our digitized world, we're used to digitizing everything. Digital cameras, computers, the internet. What have we done to information? Well, we've simplified it, as we like to do with everything. We abstract, we simplify, we separate it from reality. So numbers are not rich and complex. Actually, in our computers, they're binary. They're one or zero. We do this deliberately. Our very theory of information is built upon ones and zeros. We think it allows us to transmit information better, to store it better, to copy it better, to understand uh, complexity, to understand encryption. All of these things are easier <coughs> if you just have a one and a zero. The problem is you need a lot of ones and zeros. Think about what information is in biology. <coughs> There's no ones and zeros inside this. Actually, if you really think about the information inside your own cells, well, there's seven or 800 megabytes, if you like, of information inside each of your cells in your DNA. You start with just one copy, remember? A single fertilized egg. This is reproduced trillions upon trillions of times as you develop, and it's happening right now. Throughout your lives, your cells are dying and being re replaced. So the information in your DNA is being copied again and again and again. And guess what? Those copies are really, really good copies. So information storage, transmission, and copying in biology is actually better than we can do it with our binary information. We can squeeze more information, or nature can squeeze more information, to smaller spaces using a richer idea of what information is than we can with binary information. So what does this mean? What is information in biology? Well, I would argue information is not some abstraction. It's not some made-up thing. 
like everything in biology, information is physical. It's made of shape and form. Information in your DNA is made from the very shape of those DNA molecules interacting with proteins, which fold themselves into very specific shapes. It's a very rich way of representing information. Now, I'm not the only one to think about these ideas. In 1957, there was a guy called Lionel Penrose. He was the father of someone called Roger Penrose, who you may have heard of. Now, Lionel was a geneticist and a mathematician, and in 57, he was interested in these questions. What shape, at a molecular level, corresponds to information such that that shape could reproduce itself? This is the origins of life itself. What molecule could actually make copies of itself? And what, what does it mean in terms of shape? Could we make another shape that could also reproduce itself? So he and his son went to their workshop and they made out of plywood various shapes. In my lab, we reproduce them in metal. So these are exactly the shapes that Lionel Penrose and his son made. You can see in the middle here, we have a seed shape and we have components here. So he was wondering, could we have a specific shape such that if you add energy, it could reproduce itself? And as you can see, yes. So this is his 1957 idea. We now have three copies of that original. <coughs> okay, so this is a very simple understanding of how information and shape are the same thing. And we can get a handle on these things. But what happens if we go further? What happens if we take this understanding and we want to make some kind of technology that exploits this understanding? Now, I put this to a, a master's student several years ago, and he spent several years working with me. He was called Navni Bala, and he's since got his doctorate on, on this work. I asked him, OK, we all know about Lego bricks. Can you design me a set of Lego bricks such that got the right shape, such that if I put them in a bucket and I shake that bucket, they self-assemble themselves. They glue themselves together to produce a form that I would like them to be, a, a larger form. Can we, basically what I was asking was, can we have a self-assembling technology? Now, it turns out it's quite difficult, not surprisingly. <laughs> So the way he chose to do it after looking for many years was to use something called a genetic algorithm. And this simulates evolution inside a computer. He spent many years trying to understand how shape and form are related. And then he evolved the shape of components such that when they were placed in a jar and they were agitated, they would assemble themselves into desired shapes. And these are printed out using a 3D printer. So I hope you can see that these have already, in fact, assembled themselves into simple little forms inside here. So this, of course, is still very simple. These are not massively complex forms. In fact, if you think about it, these are simpler than just atoms gluing themselves together into molecules. These are the lowest possible building blocks that are used in terms of natural uh, organisms. I mean, nature uses far more complicated self-assembling structures in DNA, and of course, far more, again, complicated structures in our own cells as they self-assemble to become us. But nevertheless, this is the beginning. We think if we use methods such as evolution, such as rapid prototyping through 3D printers, maybe we can start producing technology that has more of the natural features. Maybe we move away from the brittle technologies of a computer that dies too quickly and towards something more like our own bones, perhaps. So inside our bones, of course, our bones aren't solid. There's a lattice work. <coughs> They're solid on the outside. They have an internal lattice work on the inside. 
and this makes them lightweight, but it makes them able to withstand certain forces in different directions. This, of course, is not a real bone. This is actually a 3D printed bone. And the internal lattice work was calculated by a computer. A zoomed in lattice work looks a bit like this. This is also 3D printed. So this is the kind of thing that we can produce. We could never injection mold or use traditional manufacturing methods with such a thing. But this allows us now to use biological methods, if you like. We can evolve the internal microstructures of materials. We can indeed, and my, I have another student who has produced these beautiful things for his company. Um, he specializes in optimizing the internal microstructure of materials, obviously much, much smaller than this, such that we can indeed have bone implants. We can print in titanium. We can have cranial replacements if someone's hurt their skulls. We can do many other kinds of technologies, even soles of shoes or implants of shoes. We can do aerodynamic wings. All of these things are now possible not just because of the clever technologies of 3D printing, but because we understand how to embody these things in the real world, how to make our designs and test them in the real world, just as nature does. Now, as much as we've made progress with these things, um, it's not as far as I would like to go. I spend many years working with biologists as well as developing novel technologies. And so we model many aspects of biology. We model tumor development. We model evolution. We model ecosystems. We model immune systems. We model flocks of birds and ant colonies. All of these different emergent complex systems we examine to try and understand them. And all of them have those biological properties I was talking about earlier. They have randomness, they're parallel, they're distributed, and all of them are extremely difficult to model using this conventional technology here. Yes, it fails all the time. So I got sufficiently frustrated that I decided it was time to create something a little different. This is my own computer which is configured and designed on this circuitry to behave like a biological organism. This is naturally parallel, naturally distributed. This has randomness as part of its functioning. This is my systemic computer. And we've shown that we can indeed use it to model and simulate biological systems of far greater size and complexity than is possible using conventional computers. But even this, I have to say, it's not really what I'd like to do. What I'd really like to do is get away from conventional electronics either. What I'd really like to do is have computers made of physical things. This still uses binary. I don't want to use binary. I want to have rich physical computation. What would that look like? I mean, what would a physical computer even mean? Well, of course we've had such things for thousands of years. This is a physical computer. Of course it is. The movement of these beads is a physical computation. The position of them is information. We already have it. But even this, I have to say, nature has got there first. So if you imagine pebbles on a beach, if you walk on a pebbly beach, such as we often have on the south coast in the UK, Brighton or Hastings, you walk along the beach, you see rows of these stones. Because of the interaction of the waves and the stones, they become sorted into large and small, large and small. In fact, this sorting is a computation. If you try to get a computer to sort this number of things in parallel, Remember, this many trillions and trillions of objects into categories of small and large. And remember, across all the beaches, all the pebbly beaches of the world, frankly, we haven't got the computers to do it. 
So when I ask, what is the sound of numbers crunching? Listen. Thank you.